Welcome to our first set of notes in Unit 8, which is on motivation, emotion, and stress. And each of those three terms we'll kind of talk about with various sets of notes. This set of notes is an introduction to motivation. And what we'll be doing is talking about the multiple theories as to why or how humans are motivated. So why or how are, are humans motivated? Um, let's talk about motivation in the first place. It includes the influences that account for the initiation, so starting the direction, which way we go, the intensity and persistence of behavior, and that how driven are we towards certain things? What are those things and why? So it's why we do what we do. And Aaron Rolson was motivated to cut off his own arm to free himself from a rock that pinned him down. James Franco played him in the movie. Um, Aaron Rolson was, he kind of like an adrenaline junkie, not really, I guess, but he would go hiking in uh, many parts of the world and he would just go all by himself. And one day he fell into like a, a not a ravine, but like a crack between two cliffs essentially. Um, and the like boulder caught his arm and he was going to die there. Um, but he was able to break the bone and cut off his own arm and then crawl or you know climb out of the hole he was in and find help. So I don't know about you, but I probably could never do something like that, but he was motivated to do this. And that, not that he wanted to, but there was something in him driving towards that survival. And just saying that it's survival instinct is not good enough. So let's talk about where our motivation comes from. And there's kind of four different factors to consider. The biological ones being very obvious, food, water, um, temperature regulation, and sleep. Um, and also sex and that like think of temperature regulation and that when you're really hot right um, sometimes there can be some anxiety surrounding that of like oh I'm, I'm too I'm too hot right now and you're motivated to cool yourself somehow emotional factors um, panic fear anger love hatred all of those things kind of motivate you toward different things um, cognitive factors so perceptions of the world beliefs about what they can or can't do and expectations about how others will respond to them. All of these thinking factors. And then social factors, so reactions from friends and family, teachers, media, and other social cultural factors are definitely motivators for us. There's different theories of motivation and we're gonna talk about each of these five. Um, and you'll see on your notes that I've kind of bulleted them for you. Um, there is a lot written already, but any examples that I give, um, you could be writing around, around each section in your notes and make sure that you know the difference in all of these. So instincts and evolutionary theories. An instinct, and we, you've got to make sure that you know what this is, but also what it is not. It's the innate, automatic disposition toward responding in a particular way when confronted with a specific stimulus. You do not have to learn this. An animal is not taught how to do this. They are just born knowing how to do it. Now what makes this evolutionary is that because they're born doing this, it means it's genetic, right? There's some kind of genetic mutation and it will continue in a species if it helps them to survive and hence they've passed down that genetic mutation. This is evolution at its best. Right? An instinct that gives a species an advantage in their environment evolutionarily will be passed down throughout the species because it helps them thrive. So birds build nests, salmon spawn, and do these items perfectly the first time they do it because these behaviors are ingrained in their genetic code because it allows them to survive. The problem with this theory, especially with humans, um, really it's not common with humans as it is with other species and that we have some instincts when we are born because they do they give us an evolutionary advantage these are the reflexes that like these instinctual behaviors that we have when we're born like um, the rooting reflex which we'll talk about in unit 9 the sucking reflex um, the startle reflex all of these things help us as this helpless newborn very small human being 
to survive. However, we grow out of those. Humans do not have instinctual behavior like that that a bird does when they nest or a, sa a salmon does when they spawn. Like We don't have that. And people could argue with you on this. Tell them no, they don't. Even the maternal instinct, it's not an instinct. You're not it's not ingrained in your genetic code on how to be a mother. It's just, it's just the idea that you love your child because there are mothers out there who unfortunately don't, right? Like, it's sad, but that is not an instinct. Humans have some instinctual behaviors at birth, yet these instincts dissipate over the first few months. Most psychologists and other, other than evolutionary psychs believe that human behavior is directed by physiological and psychological forces, not instinctual ones. So the next theory we're gonna talk about is drive reduction theory. And we have to talk about just drives in general in our converse, conversation here. So drive reduction theory is motivation arises from imbalances in homeostasis. Quick review, homeostasis is like your even keel, everything is balanced, normal state. Physical, emotional, mental, everything. Drive reduction is when there's an imbalance in homeostasis and we are driven to reduce that imbalance. So there's an imbalance, say it's hunger, okay? That imbalance, well, it's not just hunger. The imbalance is your stomach is empty, your blood sugar is low. The imbalance creates a need, right? You have a need for food. The brain responds by, okay, I really need to motivate this body that I'm occupying um, by making it go get food. So it creates a drive. The drive is the hunger and that's, yes, it includes your stomach growling and your low blood sugar, but it's more than just that. There's a cognitive piece and then it almost gives you some anxiety about it and that, um, because you have some anxiety, you want to reduce that, right? And you want to eat. That then prompts the organism, the human, to take action to satisfy or reduce, hence the name, that drive. Okay, so yes, you're reducing the drive because there's a lot more involved in there than just like your low blood sugar. There's the anxiety, there's that, um, that you need to get going right now feeling. Another example would be that you have had no water for some time, okay? So the chemical balance of your body fluids is disturbed, creating the biological need for water, much like the example we did with food. So one consequence of this need is a drive of thirst that motivates you to find water. After you drink, the need for water is met, so the drive to drink is reduced. And again, the same is true for food, okay? So let's talk incentive theory. It states that behavior is directed toward attaining desirable stimuli and avoided unwanted stimuli. Where our needs and drives push us into action, incentives pull us. So think of with drive reduction and the imbalance in homeostasis. The drive that is created is internal, right? So it pushes you, right? It pushes you from within. Whereas an incentive is outside of you, a positive or negative stimuli that pulls you toward it. Right? It pulls us in one way or another to satisfy our needs and wants. The value of an incentive is influenced by both biological and cognitive factors. Okay, so a yummy cookie if you, I don't know, do your chores, right? That's going to pull you towards the cookie and doing your chores is what you have to do in order to get the cookie. It pulls you towards that. Okay, the next theory is optimum arousal. And I don't want you to think of arousal sexually. Arousal is alertness. It's the, the continuum of one end being complete utter boredom. Like, I am so bored, I'm gonna start tearing out my hair. And the other end being so incredibly sensory, like overloaded, stressed out arouse like just too much going on that I can't even take in what's going on okay so human motivation aims not to eliminate arousal but to seek optimum levels of arousal okay so the optimum level of arousal is unique to each individual generally we try to increase arousal when it's too low when we're bored but then decrease arousal when it's too high when we're too stressed out Okay, we want to be somewhere in the middle. 
but your optimum, like your ideal level of arousal is unique to you. So for instance, Aaron Ralston back at the beginning of the slides, his optimum level of arousal is more towards the higher end. Not that he wants to be stressed out, but that he needs more in order to be kind of satisfied with what he is doing. Whereas some people who are satisfied just like, you know, binge watching some television on Netflix on their couch, right? They are on the lower end of optimum arousal. Young monkeys and children are known to explore environment in the absence of a need-based drive in that they are driven by something other than they just need water or food. It's because they don't want to just be sitting there like lumps on a log doing nothing. They would like something to do, some kind of level of arousal. Let's talk about um, your, this term here, yerkes dobson Law. This is very similar, but still different than optimum arousal. This says that we're not, it doesn't only say that we're seeking an optimum level of arousal. It says that we perform best when arousal is moderate and that our performance is best when we are not too bored, not too stressed, when we've got to be somewhere in, in between. So your level of arousal can actually be measured by electrical activity in your brain, heart rate, or even muscle tension. Um, normally arousal is lowest during sleep and highest during panic or great excitement. So that kind of gives you what the, what the continuum is. Some people, and we've kind of said this before, the adrenaline junkies, they like the extremely high levels of arousal, while others are just satisfied with their Netflix and popcorn on the couch, right? Okay, the last theory that we have is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we're gonna see this multiple times throughout our course. So you've gotta make sure you understand. Maslow is the guy who came up with this hierarchy of needs. You do need to know all five levels and what they are. But the biggest underlying concept that you have to understand is that we start at the bottom. We have to meet these lower needs before moving up. So we have to meet our biological and physiological needs of air, food, drink, shelter, warm sex, sleep, etc., before moving up to safety needs and meet those before we move up to belongingness and love, etc. But the idea is that we are all motivated to move up the hierarchy. We are all striving for, and you should write this down, we are all striving for this top level of self-actualization. And just we have some steps to conquer along the way. So needs don't have to be fulfilled 100% to move up to the next level. The average American is about 85% at level one, 70% um, at level two, 50% of belongingness and love needs at level three, 40% of esteem needs at level four, and 10% um, get to level five. The theory is a bit arbitrary, and the order is not universally fixed, as there will always be exceptions, like the person who starves himself to prove a political point, something like that, right? Like they are, are skipping one, and we humans just make things complicated. But um, you do need to understand each of these five levels, so make sure you have them written down on your notes, but also what each of them are, and make sure that you draw an arrow moving up the hierarchy, because that's kind of the point of the whole thing.